We also know that our platforms really facilitate um, entrepreneurs being able to reach other audiences. So this isn't, I, I'll give you a, an example. So this isn't specific to this region, but this dress that I'm wearing now is made by a designer in Nigeria. She is someone who's able to reach a broad audience specifically because of Facebook. This bracelet I'm wearing is from a de woman designer in Vietnam. She specifically was able to reach an audience because of Facebook. And because we know what the power of our platform in connecting people and connecting businesses, because of that, we've decided to do trainings that really focus on um, empowering women to use our platform to reach audiences. And so one of those is She Means Business. So what She Means Business does is we try and empower women to, to pursue great business ideas and to learn how to use our platform. So essentially digital marketing using all of our platforms. Since the program began in 2016, so we started this as a global program, we've supported women entrepreneurs with training, with mentorship, and trained in person and online about 500,000 women in 48 countries around the globe. We launched here in Dubai in 2017, and since then we've trained over 14,000 women across Middle East and North Africa to use Facebook and Instagram to start and to develop their businesses. Thank you. The numbers are certainly impressive. Um, you announced uh, a partnership with the Khalifa Fund. Could you tell us what drove uh, the partnership and what the partnership aims to do? Um, so we're very excited about our partnership with the Khalifa Fund. It's a, it's a partnership in order to contribute towards hand, enhancing um, the country's e um, competitive economy. Again, when I talked about She Means Business, we t if you think about women being the backbone of society and entrepreneurship being the backbone of the economy, being able to give women the skills to do that here themselves is critically important to us. And being able to work with a partner that is already well known and has an incredible reputation for serving the, uh, the audience that we're trying to serve was really great for us. And so we're very excited to See, so far we've reached a thousand women and we look forward to reaching many, many more with a partnership with an organization that is already um, connected to the, to the group we want to reach. Thank you. Um, I understand that one of the missions of your team is to create a social and economic impact by partnering with uh, political ecosystems. I'm assuming Khalifa Fund is uh, basically a, a result of or, or, or one of the ways uh, for you to achieve this mission. What are your plans for the future, specifically in the region, taken into consideration uh, the amazing transformation we're seeing? Um, so I think it's important to, to, to note that we partner with government and we also partner with civil society. I think um, knowing how important entrepreneurship is across the region and knowing how important a group or a category women are, um, we, have, we look very much forward to having many, many more partnerships. We're also looking at ways in which um, empowering women can help them have voice in conversations about policy. We think that there are many, many opportunities for policy to address the issues that women think are important, and we think that economic power also leads to political power. Um, so that's one of the ways that we think um, uh, 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 creating opportunities to amplify women's voice, creating opportunities for women to drive business businesses also drives um, important changes in policy um, that will enable them to have even more uh, opportunity and have have even more voice. Thank you. Would you mind sharing with us some of the success stories and lessons learned from She Means Business? Yes, hang on. I'm uh, to make sure I get some stories. Take your time to put in as many stories you want. Uh, yes, I want to make sure because I have two stories of women that I think are incredibly interesting. Um, so one, we have Mai Madhat and uh, Nihal Fares. These are Egyptian entrepreneurs who partnered to create Eventus. I think hearing stories about what women have actually done is really important. Sometimes when you hear oh, entrepreneurship is, is, is important or um, uh, building business is important, it's, it, it sounds... Um, uh, it sounds like theory, but hearing stories of what women actually do, have done, it t turns it into possibility. Um, so these two women created Eventus, which is an app and enables organizers to consolidate efforts for planning, for market, for ticket sales. Mai represented the Middle East startup community on a panel with then-President Barack Obama and, and Facebook CEO Mark. Um, her, that intention led her to be recognized as one of the world's most promising innovators in 2016. Iman Ben Shaiba founded Sale Publishing, so that's a digital content hub about cultural and community matters. I think that's important because it talks to the extent to which um, social media um, can be an opportunity to amplify voice and to tell different stories. I think stories are so important. Stories g give us an idea of what's possible. Not just what's possible now, but it gives you an idea of what's possible in the future. Um, so what she did for her efforts, um, she earned several industry accolades, including Young Entrepreneur of the Year um, at the Second Ar Arabian Business Startup Awards and the, um, and the Digital Publishing Award by the 
British Council UAE. That's, those are just a couple of examples. Do you want to give more examples? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> no, no. No worries. Um, the way I see women empowerment is it's a two-sided relationship. Yeah. If you're committed to it, you certainly gain something in return. Talk to us about your personal experience and what your journey has, how your journey has benefited you and what the impact was, you, was, was on you personally. Well, I mean, if I'm going to talk personally, I think it has to start with my family. Um, so everyone here represents, everyone who's sitting here represents people who came before, that, before them. So I always say that I am the, I come from a long line of, of troublemaking women. So my grandmother um, was a woman, that she, we called them market women. So I'm from Nigeria. So my grandmother was a market woman. And that means she was an entrepreneur and she sold in the market in Nigeria about 60 years ago. Not only was she a market woman, she was um, from the a market town of Aba in the eastern part of Nigeria. And um, if you know Nigerian history, um, the, there is Aba market women riots where, where the British at the, t at the time were colonizing Nigeria and they tried to implement a tax that would destroy the revenue for these women. The women got together and said, absolutely not. And as a result of it, they created a riot and a revolt that brought down that tax. My grandmother was one of those women. And so when I say I stand on the shoulders of giants, I stand on the shoulders of a woman who's an entrepreneur and a political activist and who said no when no needed to be said. My mother um, was born in Nigeria and actually left Nigeria when she was 16 to go to the UK to go to university. Um, she went by herself. She, so I think of myself as being you know, a, a, a brave because I left the US to live in London. Imagine in the 60s at the time, leaving at 16 to go to the UK. There's no phones, there's no internet. Um, she, as far as she knew, she's on a completely different planet. Um, she left and, and from there she actually went to the US to complete her studies. Um, so again, when I think of my grandmother, when I think of my mother, these are women who, who set an incredibly strong example for me of bravery, of courage, and also of people who, who made it clear that you could have a family and you could also have, uh, have a career. My grandmother had seven children who lived, which obviously is, was not an aim for me, but she had seven children who lived, and, and my mother had five. I think we're going down. I have three, so perhaps my daughter will have one. I don't, I don't know how that works. Um, but just the, the notion that um, one didn't have to take away from the, the other and that it was possible to create um, possibility for your family, um, it was possible to create a life for your family and still be an independent person. Um, so when I think about, um, uh, about my career, I think about what I owe to people who came before me so that they struggled and they survived so that I could survive. And so now I have three children. Uh, two of them are daughters, um, and so when they think of when they uh, think of what's possible for them they think anything's possible my uh, my nine-year-old on her own completely unprompted uh, decided that she was running for president I, mean, I, I think I mean she'd be better than some of the candidates we have out now in some countries um, and she did her own campaign uh, poster and again she, for her the sky is the limit and I think that's the, th the powerful thing about stories being able to look and think if someone else can do it, I can do it as well. And so I, again, I see myself as being uh, someone who's a bridge between generations and also um, demonstrating to people who come after me um, what's possible. That was amazing. Okay, um, any, if you had one piece of advice to give to our audience here today and one takeaway, what, what would it be? Um, Women empowerment, just summarize everything. One, one sentence, one piece of advice. Okay, that, that's a tall order. I can't do one sentence. Okay, you can go, um, you can have a paragraph. Okay, so I'm going to start. So first of all, I, I always, I'm always itchy about advice because I think sometimes advice is more about the person giving it than the person getting it, right? Because so, when someone's giving you advice, they're basically telling their story. Um, so this is basically my story. You can take it or leave it. Um, but the thing with advice is, um, is a couple things. One, um, just because you get resistance doesn't mean you're wrong. So one of the things I've learned in, in, at, at work and in life is that sometimes when you're, pushing, when you're pushing and you get the hardest pushback, it's because you're doing exactly the right thing. And I think especially as a woman, especially as someone who's in a minority, sometimes that resistance means you're doing exactly the right thing. Um, the other uh, piece of advice that I would um, sort of give for my career is, um, uh, is to trust your, is to bring your authentic self and to trust yourself. And I know people have talked about this, but uh, for example, uh, there can be a narrative about how you need to show up. Like you need to look a certain way or you need to work a certain job. We were actually talking before. So when I first started, I was a corporate lawyer. I just talked about how I was a corporate lawyer. 
Uh, part of the reason why I was a corporate lawyer is because my parents are Nigerian, and Nigerian immigrants in the U.S., you had very limited uh, acceptable choices. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be an engineer, you could be a professor, or you could be a disgrace to your family. So lawyer was kind of the, one of the things I chose. And so when I first started, as I said before, I was terrible at it, and I hated it. Um, and there can be a pressure of thinking, well, I need to do this because I owe, or because my family expected to me, or because I went to this school, or because this is where I make money. And so this, the moment where I stepped away, when I, so I, I, I quickly went over my career, but I actually left my corporate job for a year and, and traveled and volunteered and didn't leave to go to something, which again, in, in the universe of, Niger of Nigeria, and immigrant parents is like unheard of. How could you do such a thing? A disgrace. But doing that and stepping back and figuring out what my mission and purpose it was is the most important thing. It's the, it's the best thing I've ever done for myself because ever since then, every single job I've had has been so closely aligned to mission and purpose. And it wouldn't have happened if I would, hadn't been willing to listen to myself, to listen to the inner voice and take a step back. So again, be authentic, listen to your inner voice and you know much more than you think you do. Thank you. We have 10 minutes left for the session. Does anyone have any questions for Ibele? I think that's a good question. So I think everyone is going to have their individual strategy. I have to say that the older I got, the more I insisted upon being myself. So I think when I was much younger, I thought, well, if I, if there, if I fit in in a certain way or if I'm getting pressure behind me, if, if there must be a way that I can look more or feel more like the majority and the pressure will stop coming. What I found is the more I was my, myself and the more I didn't compromise when it came to my values, the more successful I felt within myself. And again, the more I was realistic about who I was and what I wanted to do, um, because I think when you're aligned with mission and when you're aligned with purpose, there's a way that you show up that is so different than when you're trying to do what everybody else thinks you should do. Um, the other thing is I also created community. So I always created community at work. So I found mentors. I found people um, uh, at work who could be my sponsors. So identifying senior people. At, at, and I've never been an entrepreneur. So I think um, being an entrepreneur is a very different, uh, is a very different, very hard, um, and very rewarding in, a, in very different ways. But I think some of the transferable things are finding people who can, who can coach you, find pe finding people who can mentor you, um, finding people who understand the struggles you have, but also finding people in the majority who can lead the way for you because they have opportunities that you might not have. Um, so those are some of the things that, that I use to address um, the issues of being different. Yeah. Anyone else? Your voice is loud enough. How did you take the step to leave corporate law? How did you take the step to leave corporate law? <laughs> Can, can I just say that this is my trainee lawyer. Thank you. You're already leaving. Okay. <laughs> what have you done? So, so, so I actually, so that was actually a hard thing for me. So this was in the, this was 2000. So 2000, I, don't, I mean, this is like ancient history for some of you here. Like, I don't know, were some of you even born? Anyway, so in 2000, it was right before a huge crash, but I didn't know the huge crash was coming. And so I was at, I had gone to Columbia, which in the US is a really good university. I was at a very good firm, I was at Davis Polk. So the sense was like, I, I could leave and nothing would happen. So I thought, I'll just take a little bit of time off. I'll figure out what I want to do. If I decide I want to go back to law, to law firms, law firm jobs are easy to, ha are easy to find. I mean, at that time, they really were. At that time, they really were. So I took a year off, and I decided I was going to do a couple things. One, I was going to, I, to volunteer. I was going to take, I was going to brush up on my French. So I took three months of immersion class uh, in France. And then I, I volunteered for civil society organizations. I was very specific about the ones I picked. Children's rights, human rights, and women's rights. And my, my plan was that after that, I could go back to the law firm. But this happened to be, by the time I did this, it was 2001 when I had done it. And, I was just, and then I came back to New York. And I remember coming back to New York, I think, because my last place was in Senegal. I came back to New York like September 6th. And I had a friend who worked um, uh, at, a, at a brokerage house. And I, I, as soon as we got back, I said, oh, I'll come see you. 
I'll come see you like September 9th. We'll hang out. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, I, I, for, I, I missed seeing him because I was doing something else. Um, and then September 11th happened, and he happened to work at Kenner Fitzgerald, and he was killed um, during September 11th. And so it was a very... Um, uh, it's a moment that's it's a cliche in some ways because I realized I didn't have I didn't necessarily have all the time that I had to figure out what I wanted to do right this is someone who's my friend someone I had known since I was 13 years old um, and you know life is short but seeing it happen then you realize then I, in that moment I told myself I don't know how much time I have but whatever the time that I have left I want to make sure that I'm working according to mission and purpose and so that for me that was when I decided um, and then I, I said actually I don't want to go back to law firm it was like you know you were high I don't wear high heels anymore, but you know when you're at high heels and they're, they're super tight and they pinch your shoe, your feet, and at the end of the day you take them off, like you could put them on in the beginning of the day, and then the day you take them off and you can't, then you're, if someone asks you to put them back on, you can't. And that's what it felt, that's what going back to a law firm felt like to me. I had taken them off, I couldn't do it again. <laughs> I couldn't put it back on, and I really had to work to mission and purpose. And so that's how I left. Again, I think your 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 um, path can be different. And I have friends who stayed in the law and who love it. Um, but for me, I didn't. But um, I took that leap, and that's how I ended up staying out. <laughs> Thank you, Ebed. Keep your high heels on for as long as you can, please. <laughs> um, I don't know if we have, okay, we've got six more minutes. Any more questions? Hi. Um, so if your daughter does not become the president or she decides to change course before then and she opens her own business, what platform will she be using in the future? Yes, because I think for many of us growing up, we social media didn't exist. We didn't know it was going to make such a big difference in the world of women and business and small businesses. But what is on the horizon for our children, for the next generation? What will be the next best thing that we can't imagine now, but which perhaps you can? So I'm actually old now. So in tech, so I'm 40, I'll be 46 next month. So in tech, that's ancient. Like tech, you're like a grand f f person. So I, I have to say that I actually can't envision what's next, but what I think is beautiful and what's amazing is that maybe it's my daughter who can. Maybe it's one of these little girls who hasn't been born. And I think that to me is the promise of technology or what I want the promise of technology to be, um, for it to act, democratize access to information so that the people now, the girls now who are figuring out what they want to be, that they're creating whatever the next platform is. That the next Mark Zuckerberg is not a Mark Zuckerberg, that it's a, that it's a Shahed from, from Lebanon, you know, as opposed to it being someone from, from the U.S., someone who's a man from the U.S. So, so the short answer to your question is I don't know, but I hope one of these girls um, is the one who creates it. So how is Facebook helping nonprofits? Are you doing anything for nonprofits? And if so, how? So that's a great question. Um, nonprofits have, as you can imagine, are very close to my heart given my personal background. Um, so there are a couple things we do. So one, we provide ad credits for nonprofits. We know that our platforms are very powerful for engaging, non for helping nonprofits reach audiences. So we do ad credits. We also do um, various partnerships with nonprofits. So depending on the type of nonprofit, um, we might do partnerships related to health. So my team across um, Africa does partnerships related to health. Um, so, so for example, we did a partnership with a nonprofit in Nigeria looking at um, infectious disease prevention and so we partnered with them to ensure that a they got the message out about prevention and then also that they got data to see where there are hot spots um, where their issues we partner with nonprofits when it comes to safety so um, a, a child safety online or new to the internet on uh, or people who are new to the internet doing trainings um, so there are a number of ways that we engage with nonprofits and in fact if you do a search for just do Facebook nonprofits or because uh, I can't remember if it's facebook.com backslash nonprofits it gives you um, an, a, an overview of all of the of some of the work that we're doing around nonprofits, um, some of the, uh, the um, stories around ad credits, um, some of the stories around um, partnerships around the globe. Yeah. Any more questions before we close? I guess that's it. Thank you very much, Ibele. I'm sure there's so much more to talk about, but thank you very much for a very interesting session. Can we have a big round of applause for Ibele, her mother, her grandmother, and the future president? And for you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.